Good, happy kind of lunchtime here. I am Heather Dahl, and I head up in DCO. And with me is Mike Vesey, who leads ID Ramp. And together, we're here to talk with you about using open source for verifiable credentials. Mike and I have been working on this um, for long time, I think probably five years, um, we have been in this community together, in fact, met at a community event and started working together um, through multiple iterations on the projects that bring us here to talk with you today. And so I think what's terrific about this session is it's actually this community, it's Hyperledger and the projects that brought us together and our companies together to partner and collaborate. And here we are um, years on and we're talking um, when we actually met in a presentation. And so what I want to do is bring up an oldie but goodie. And we know this slide, and that's always a good one to level set, why are we here? And that's because we've got an identity problem on the internet. And if anything, the last two years, um, or every time you try to use your username or password, you're reminded of this problem. And why is it? Why are we here in this session today? Because... We have legacy identity systems. And while they were good for a moment in time, um, we are at the point where we need to extend this legacy approach, where you have a single privately controlled database where trust is brought to a single domain, which if you are a hacker, this looks fantastic. But if you're us and you're those who want to have the ability to control or manage or share your information without a gazillion direct database integrations, and you also want to reduce your risk because you're looking at a zero trust framework, this is not your friend. And so what are we going to do? Well, this is not what we want to do anymore. We want to take this world of duplicated identities, duplicated username and password, duplicated everything that's causing us headaches, and we want to move to a decentralized approach. And that, this is why we're here talking about verifiable credentials. Um, that's because, think about it as the human or the device or the organization or the entity sits in the middle, and they have the ability to be the conduit of their trusted, verified, and authentic data. So what we talk about here is a trusted digital ecosystem. This is more than just two parties on a direct integration. You have to think about the space of verifiable credentials as a full ecosystem. If you don't have the full ecosystem, you have a one-handed handshake. I think for many years in this space, we were really, really focused on the issuer, or we were really, really focused on a wallet. And then people are saying, well, it's not getting adopted. And you go and have a conversation. They're talking about my wallet, my wallet, my wallet. OK, you've got a wallet. What can you do with the wallet? Or the talk was about the network, the ledger, the ledger. You got a ledger. Now what are you going to do, right? So a trusted digital bring a ecosystem brings all of the components that you need for scale and adoption together. And if you are not in a system or you're not thinking about how do all these components, an issuer, a holder, a verifier, a ledger, and then like a mediator, your schemas, et cetera, if you're not thinking about it in one entire picture, you got a one-handed handshake and your scale and your production is only going to go so far. And so what we see when customers are looking at buying verifiable credentials, they themselves are looking at a complete ecosystem. These ecosystems are privacy by design. The ecosystems are designed to scale and really solve the problem around security, remove direct integrations. Um, Businesses and governments are using this model, and we can get into some of those use cases, and really Mike's going to dive into those. So one of the important things I always talk about is in when I became involved in this um, quite a while ago, how did I get involved with um, 
decentralized identity. I actually got involved with it from security side. I was working on security solutions. And it was on the very early days when we were developing what is now known as the Zero Trust um, framework. I was working with John Kindervag at Forrester, who helped drive Zero Trust forward. And when we were looking at that was if you were going to use a, a never trust, always verify approach to your framework, well, are you going to go trust an identity that's once again on a centralized database. So the idea behind verifiable credentials and decentralized identity in that, in that um, perspective really drove at the fact if you're never going to trust and always verify, you're going to use a decentralized approach to the identity to verify. And so if you're developing a zero trust framework, um, decentralized identity is the salt and pepper. You pass them together. And so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Mike to pick up from here. Thanks, Heather. Great. Yeah, and I'll pick right up from that uh, from that excellent overview. So, what Heather was describing was really um, the uh, another building block, right? It was another component that we can use in our identity strategies, and um, and decentralization is coming. So, let me give you a couple of um, uh, a couple of market view um, ideas first. So. Um, not sure we had this slide. Let me just get through this. All right, so here's where I want to start. The market views is great. We're going to get to that a little bit later. Um, as Heather was mentioning, these building blocks used for uh, identity composition. Interesting thing happened this spring at EIC. Martin Kupiger, Kupiger Cole, actually coined this new term, composable enterprise. And he was talking about creating these building blocks, these recipes that, that organizations and enterprises can use to build their identity strategy and their authentication flows. And so some really interesting things came out of that. We're hearing the same types of, of message that, that we've known and been promoting for a while. And now it's being adopted by the analysts. The analysts are kind of seeing the value and the opportunity of, of having um, organizations be able to really tailor their own experience. So, some of the things, you know, plug and play, obviously, in, easy to integrate, um, chain of trust ecosystems, as Heather was talking about, organizations are looking at creating their own ecosystems um, around decentralization. But that's great. We have to be able to integrate that into existing uh, technologies and existing ecosystems today. So it's awesome that, 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 that uh, Kupiger Hole got behind this and really said, hey, the organizations that we're working with really need a, a more granular way to deploy their authentication, their access schemes. Then another interesting thing happened. Gartner came out with a quote that reads pretty much the same way. They're saying in the very short, uh, in the very near future, there's going to be this, this, this notion of decentralized identity and people are going to show up with identities and you as organizations have to figure out how to deal with it, right? So we're seeing this across all different sectors of, of the uh, it's not just limited to uh, enterprise, it's also public sector, fintech, health, utilities, the full, the full spectrum. So really interesting now that we have two of the major players in the analyst space that are saying, hey, you guys have to have a strategy for decentralization because it's coming. And, uh, uh, and so we think it's very interesting to, um, to lean into that with some of the technology that we've been developing. So, Another thing that we have as a benefit here is we're building these trust ecosystems and it helps on every aspect. So it helps us with um, the decentralization, sure. It helps us following those standards, but also when we're controlling that data in a more privacy preserving way, it helps to accomplish all these other things that we, we hear so much about. GDPR is much easier when you involve the holder, the, the user, you and I, in the transaction. So. A lot of really good things uh, are going to come out of this and it will make some of the compliance stuff that we struggle with uh, all the time much easier. Okay, and now I think uh, I was ready for that market message, but we're going to start talking about some tactical uh, projects. And this is kind of, this is fun for me because every time we do a presentation, um, People always look at it and, and listen and they go, yeah, great, you know, we can build this technology, uh, but how do we use it? Is anyone really doing anything with decentralized technologies today? And the answer is yes, they are. And I'm actually really happy to talk about some projects that we've been involved in with the Indicio team and, and others uh, trying to, to, to put some real rubber on the road and get some real world transactions out there. 
as of today, the state of North Dakota in the U.S. is uh, is issuing a verifiable credential to every single graduating senior, and those graduating seniors can take and, and that that credential is being issued by by the state of North Dakota. Uh, but if I, as a university, want to verify the information contained within that credential, which is the student transcript, whatever else they decide to, to put in there. I don't have to have any kind of association with the state of North Dakota. They're writing this to a public ledger, so it can be verified by anybody that has access to that public ledger and, and has been granted uh, access to, to verify against it. And, uh, and so there are organizations that, that are, I mean, we have universities that are checking those credentials. We have employers that are looking for uh, transcript information or high school education information. And they can do that without forming any kind of federation or any kind of connection back to the state of North Dakota as the actual issuer of that credential. That's really that, that triangle that Heather was showing. That, that's, that is, this is it, right? This is the reason we're doing this because it makes the verification so easy uh, to get that trusted source. And of course, all the, you know, the, the crypto behind that and everything is all just, it's, it is what it is, right? We, it's proven because the technology is, is solid. Uh, all built on Hyperledger Indy, Aries. Uh, so, and if you want to learn more about that project, kind of the, on Wednesday, I'm, I'm doing another thing on that uh, uh, on the, as part of OSS at the Trust Over IP something. We're going to get in a little bit deeper into the North Dakota education and actually show those screens and show that in process and how it's working today in the wild. Um, another interesting project is, is a Zoom attendee protection application that will actually use verifiable credentials to restrict access to any Zoom meeting that you choose. So you can basically put in a filtered list of email addresses. Um, the attendees can, can uh, ahead of time, get that verifiable credential, put it in a digital wallet. And then as they're entering the Zoom meeting, they can just scan a QR code and it'll verify whether they are actually registered for that event or in that event. And, and of course that can't be spoofed because that credential exists only one place in your wallet. So somebody can't join that meeting emulating you, which is a big problem uh, with, with Zoom attendees. So that's, a, that's a, um, another use case using verifiable credentials. Of course, it's not limited to verifiable credentials. We can use any technology to do private, uh, uh, identification uh, leading into that. But verifiable credentials is a very, very easy way to, uh, to do that verification and create those, uh, those access control lists around your Zoom meetings. Um, the third one was an interesting project we work on with the city of San Francisco in California. We did a pilot with our partner Oracle um, to show verifiable credentials replacing existing authentication for some of their public sites. At the time of this project, California had 100, or San Francisco had 141 public sites that their citizens could access. And pretty much every one of them had a different authentication process. Register, you know, enter all your information. We're going to give you a password. So imagine being a resident and trying to sort through 100 plus credentials just to interact with your state government. In about a month, we took a, uh, a system and we issued a, a, an onboarding so that they could generate a city identity and issue that to, to their citizens to be held on a wallet on their smartphone. And then using ID ramp, we, we retrofitted all 140 of those sites to use, because they were all traditionally federated, right? They all had the ability to do SAML or OIDC or OAuth or something. They just didn't know how to do verifiable credentials. We were able to build a bridge between those and retrofit all 140 of those sites to be able to consume that citizen ID credential that we took. And we did that in like 30 days. So. It's still in pilot, hasn't made it into the wild yet, but you're going to see things like that coming at you in the next few years as, as public sector ramps up their use of verifiable credentials. Uh, there are going to be many of these types of experiences which give you the ability to not only hold the information needed to authenticate, but also give consent, right? And it's a very important thing. When you scan a QR code or something to interact and log into a site, you are the one that's going to give consent. Hey this particular state service is looking for these three pieces of information, are you okay with sending them? And you can say yes, or you can say no. But Google isn't saying yes or no for you, right? That's the important takeaway from this. So incredible technology for privacy preserving authentications. It's coming fast and uh, we're thrilled to be in the middle of it and doing some work in that, in that uh, area. 
The last thing is really the ID ramp product I've mentioned. We use that to kind of put all these things together, but um, ID ramp is just a, a platform that allows you to plug in any identity source, plug in any service using traditional federation protocols, and uh, and we can you know turn your identity sources into issuers, turn your services uh, into or turn create credential based verifications in front of all your services, writing the existing rails of traditional federation protocols like SAML, OAuth, and ODC. So. Um, all right, so um, this is the, I apologize guys, I uh, have the wrong presentation because this is going through um, many different slides that we cut out. So let me just get through these and hopefully we have our summary, scri uh, summary slide. So again, that's more detailed information that I'm going to present on Wednesday, um, not, uh, not relevant here. Um, so in summary, Decentralization means we're ending, right, passwords. We're ending um, all, of the, uh, all of the things that go wrong with that. Verifiable credentials, uh, continuous authentication. The building blocks really for zero trust, I believe, have their foundation in decentralization. It's almost impossible to say we're going to create a zero trust strategy unless you're doing some fundamental things to remove passwords and give the user more interaction points with, with the technology. So. In my mind, the two are, are really hard to separate. Um, if you really want to have a good, solid zero trust strategy, you need to understand decentralization and how to leverage it. All right, let's see what else we have here. All right, uh, at this, so some of the projects that we're leveraging, and again, this is um, uh, a lot of work that we're doing with the Indicio team. They are much more active in a lot of these projects than, than we are and uh, doing some great work, but these are all the different open source projects that we're leveraging and working with on a day-to-day -day basis, and um, uh, really recommend you get involved in those and, and, and learn more about what uh, is happening, because there are some really cool real-world solutions that are happening today. Uh, some meetups, here's places you can get involved, and DCO holds many, and they're brilliant, they're excellent. Um, we hope to be uh, doing a meetup with them, I think, next month. I'm not sure, but we'll be, uh, we'll be involved in some of these as well. So really great stuff. And I think um, the, the, take, oh, the final takeaway is decentralized identity is ready for adoption now. It's not something that is still being worked on. Uh, you, can, you can build your ecosystem. You can leverage it and integrate it into your existing uh, identity strategies today. So with that, I'll thank you. And we'll take some questions if we have some time. Yes, sir. If someone steals your phone, can they also then steal your identity and log into all these different apps? No, I mean, every app, most wallet apps, and they vary on how they're protected, most wallet apps have a biometric, either using the device biometrics, you know, Apple's Face ID or Google's Face or biometric sensors. Uh, but you can certainly integrate your others. I do know there are certain wallet projects that are using uh, more strenuous uh, checks on that. But, if my wallet, if I handed it to you right now, it would do you no good. You wouldn't be able to unlock it um, because it's protected. True, yeah, but you know, how do we solve that? That's a tough one. <laughs> You're worried about more than, than your identity, yeah. Yes? Sure, so the, the data in the credential itself is held only on your device. That's the only place. So the, when the credential is issued, it's issued from your data source, right? So you can, have a, you can either say we're going to generate this based on biometrics, based on whatever, or you can say because you're part of our organization's directory, we're going to give you a credential for your employee ID. When that process happens, that information in that credential only lives on your smartphone, that's it. It doesn't live anywhere else. We take an associated record of that, and we take that, that public key and we write it out to a ledger so that it can be verified. But the data itself never goes anywhere other than on your device. Oh, they're globally deployed. Heather, I'll let you take that because that's more of the... Yeah, the, the projects are globally deployed. So within the governance, you can also establish, for instance, if you don't want the data held in the United States or it has to be held within a certain geographic region. On the side of compliance, um, the important thing is we do work with a number of governments. And the key there is when they accept um, information from a credential, 
They still put it into their systems for the instance of clearing a border. They, for instance, the government of Aruba has to hold your data for six months when you visit the island as a tourist. And then there are instructions that they have to remove the data. And so they still pull the data, but they're using um, selective disclosures. They're only pulling what they need for the purposes of crossing the border. They are holding that data within their government systems for compliance in their own auditing and then taking care of it as their government requirements are. But I think that's an important part is that the recipient, the verifier, um, can hold the data that they need to hold for regulatory purposes. Just because the holder has the data doesn't mean that the, the verifier doesn't receive it. And then the verifier can choose where they're going to hold that data for the purposes of compliance. Right. Right. So that, or, or you're a minor and you're trying to travel, et cetera. Um, guardianship, custodial, and that is work that is being done. Um, for instance, um, we do a lot of work in travel and tourism. So how does a family go on vacation, right? And, you're all, and all of you have passports, and who gets to control and manage that? And so that is work that is actively being done for the purposes of use cases that they're trying to get deployed. But the concept behind that would be the guardianship um, component of the credential of the wallet. And then what happens when, when the minor turns 18? And so how do you make that transition as well? And that's a big issue in education that we've had to deal with as well because, mm -hmm. you know, when we talk about issuing education credentials, a lot of times you are dealing with minors, right? And there's certain regulations that, that require you to handle that. So you're going to see a lot of evolution in the guardianship. Yeah, guardianship is a smart contract. Correct. Yeah, it'll, it'll fuse those. Yep, yeah, that's exactly right. It's mm -hmm. going to fuse multiple technologies, actually, to give you the, the ability to where we see a lot of organizations is what we call start simple and then scale. So they often start with the simple, you know, one person, one credential, and now they're at the point where they're realizing to scale, they have to work through the guardianship challenges and, and production deployments. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And one of the areas, um, we don't have the slide up here, but the Cardia project, Linux Foundation Public Health, um, they focus on medical health credentials. So that's a group that is often talking about this issue and working through it. So that may be a, a um, meeting that you may want to join on Thursdays. It's Thursdays at noon Eastern time. Cardia? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and the interesting, you know, it's kind of the, for me the takeaway is it's so easy to get started, and I think a lot of people are are really trying to look at the forest. You know, they're trying to get their head around the entire, how does this work? And, and the guardianship, the great questions, right? This is great thinking, but the takeaway that I really want to express is you don't need all that stuff right now. You can move the needle, right? You can eliminate passwords in 20 minutes. It's so easy, right, using this technology. And you've got to start there, and as you start, and you build your ecosystem, as Heather was saying, things just naturally evolve. And you end up with you end up with this great, you're building a better identity, right? As you're in, as you're doing this. But but don't think you can't start because it's so overwhelming, you don't know how to solve guardianship, you don't know how to solve all these problems. You can start right now and make some real differences, right? Just by starting small. Yes, sir. Related to what you said, like in the case of like North Dakota, for example. Yeah, I mean, the tough part, honestly, is is the technology conversations are still happening. So um, we will eventually get to the point where the technology and the soundness of the technology is a given. Public ledgers are embraced, and, and then we move past that and we start getting to the business conversations. Right now, it's, it's a little difficult, some of the conversations. Um, most of the larger enterprise organizations say, yeah, this is really great. Build this one. You know, build this, this thing. And, 
And that's what Heather was saying. You know, if they want to build their own ecosystem, great, because it really doesn't matter. We have the ability to, you know, do some routing. This is just like TCP back in the days. You know, when TCP/IP came out, um, it was earth-shattering, right? And we're working on right now the technology to, to allow these ledgers to, these credentials to really trans, um, transgress all these different ledgers. So it doesn't matter if if an organization comes in and says, "Hey, we want to build our own." Great, build it. I don't care. If you're okay with using a public ledger like North Dakota did, awesome, use it, right? So that's usually, at least historically, that's where we see the biggest tripping points is they're so concerned about the granularity of the technology that they they have some paralysis in the deployment because they're they're overthinking it, right? And my, to my point, don't overthink it, just do it. And if it doesn't work for you, then stop doing it. But I guarantee you, if you go through a process and hook in an existing directory of something, users of whatever it is, and you issue a credential based on that, you're going to find a hundred different ways that you can leverage that in a decentralized way that you haven't thought of because it's too hard to build those existing federations. And once you do that, you're on your way. So start small, start now, and, and go. Education is a crucial part of this in the business development sales cycle. Um, as a result of that and the needing to, ha it's not just one or two conversations. You often are in multiple conversations. And I would say the majority of that is education. It's not even um, showing the comparisons and the value prop. It's here's how it works. And one way to help shorten the sales cycle is in DCO has created a number of workshops even down to one hour for executives. And any, it's available for anyone to come to the website and engage with those. But the idea there was that's what is being used to, sh to shorten the sales cycle on this technology and speed up the adoption, just simply educating in a, in a consistent manner. Hi. Yeah. Right. Are you talking about the organizations that adopt it, where they see the value? Is that what you're referring to? Yeah, like for example, you're running this organization sure. that adopted it. Sure. So, travel agents who have a tool that kind of serves them. So, so, a few cases that we use is we get the owner of the credential paying to design the credential. Right. So I'm going to say all of the above. It, 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 there are multiple ways to monetize within the system, and you can use all or none. And I'll talk about why I say none. Um, in the monetization for travel, there's uh, the the let's say the the government or the verifier is paying the issuer, um, and for them, the fact that at the estimate and when the projects we've worked on is 70% of all paper presented was fraudulent. They're willing to pay to get rid of that fraud. And so in that sense, yes. The other, the other com component could be the passenger pays. But how does the passenger pay indirectly? Because we all know about all those little fees baked into your ticket, right? So even though they're not paying inside the, the technology, they're not transacting an exchange of value within the system. They're transacting an exchange of value to purchase the ticket, knowing that they are going to pay the airline for the ability to use this. So that's the second layer of monetization in the system. And then the next part is the derivative credential. So the government has said that this person can enter this country. Well, there are a lot of other entities in the country that would like to know that that person is there with the government's approval, especially in travel and tourism. And so then they're using that credential maybe to let you into a nightclub or to sell cigarettes or whatever. And they're willing to pay the government for the ability to do that. So then you have like an external monetization of it. So from the use cases, the monetization can happen in so many different directions. It's just who finds the most value and from whom do they get the value from. And then when I say in some cases they use no monetization, it's because the cost savings are really for either efficiency 
because they're doing so many redundant procedures or there's sheer reduction in fraud, they don't need to monetize out. And so that's one interesting way to look at it. Yeah, let me bring the inter uh, an enterprise point. And first of all, I think we as individuals will pay for this when the public sector picks it up, just like we pay for our driver's license credentials and other things. It, we're going to be on the hook for that. In the enterprise, though, let's look at that use case. If, if an enterprise is, what's the single largest expense that any enterprise has to deal with today? It's the IAM, right? It's the identity infrastructure. Why is that? Because Thousands of users come through that for absolutely everything, whether they're logging in or they're accessing uh, an application, they're all coming through that single point, which means I think it's very dynamic. It's constantly scaling up, scaling down, massive amounts of money. If I say, you're an employee of my organization, I'm gonna give you a credential that's stored on your phone, and you can now log into all of your applications using that credential, I'm not back calling that information to the IAM anymore. I'm saving thousands of dollars every day on the auto scaling that happens that I am infrastructure. I'm insulating myself from outages, so there's cost savings there. I'm not calling the help desk to reset my password because I don't have one. So there's massive, massive savings that the enterprise can realize right now, you know, with deployment of this technology and integration and decentralization. Well, decentralization, as Heather was referring to, there are many public networks now that are, that are worldwide. Uh, the Indicio network is, gosh, I don't know how many of those, lots. Yeah. And, and so, and you can jump in and participate on that, so it really tears down the borders. Um, where ID ramp comes into it, we're, we're really highly specialized in taking your existing identity, whatever those silos are, plugging them in and really decentralizing those. So, Eventually, we'll start adopting these public sector identities as they come on the market. You know, we're looking at the IDAS very carefully. Um, I know that there's some work to do there yet, and um, there's similar initiatives going on. So I'm hoping I'm answering your question. Yeah, I just wanted to know what was like the right? Yeah. Yeah, global, and there are many, many networks. There are European-specific networks. There's, uh, I don't know if there's a U.S.-specific networks, but they're all over the place. Yeah. You know, and, and, and it's really easy. The Indicio team, I think we worked on a project, a citizen project actually, with Oracle, and uh, the Indicio team cranked out a network running in Oracle's environment for us in 48 hours. I mean, it was stunning, right? We went from, hey, here's an idea we have, to having our own network that we could control and contain in 48 hours. So it's really, really easy to do this stuff. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Absolutely. Absolutely. And we're um, in DCO, we've been putting together interopathons. We've done with Cardia, Aries, we did work to help support an interopathon. I think it was just last week. It feels like it was yesterday. Um, but I encourage you to look for these interopathons, if not to participate, but just dial in for an hour and, and listen and watch what's going on because it's fascinating. Um, to take what you hear in these sessions and actually see it going on in front of your eyes with m multiple enterprises, organizations, institutions on there showing what they're doing and having their credentials um, passed between wallets and being verified by each other. Even if it's not use case specific, they're trying to prove the interoperability of what's underneath. Yeah, that's great. And, and that North Dakota project does just that, right? We have one company that's acting as the issuer, and there's multiple organizations that are creating verifiers for that. 
and it's only possible because those credential yeah. formats are so interoperable by the standard. So there's, it's certainly early days on that, but you're exactly right. That is the, the future. Uh, once we once we get everybody marching in the same direction uh, on credential specification, then it's uh, uh, and that's and that's not that far away, right? I mean, I think this is coming fast. So uh, again, how do we expedite it? Get involved, right? Everyone in this room, get involved. It's easy. It's cheap. Um, there's no heavy lift. Just take something you have, plug it in, and and start using it. And now you're uh, you're part of the solution, right? Because you're helping drive the solution. Yes, sir. I think, I think there will always be outliers. On the question of the Middle East, in the last couple months, I've been very surprised on the approach from nations in the Middle East, especially those that want to attract tourists. They're very sensitive about the outside perception of what governments do with their identity. And therefore, to open up their tourism, they're looking at moving to verifiable credentials for maybe not their own citizens or residents, but maybe for tourists and people visiting their countries, which is very interesting because I wouldn't have expected that even six months ago. But maybe that's the crack in the door for countries that may not want to apply it to their own citizens, but they're starting to look at this in order to open their economies for travel and tourism. And I'll do an endorsement of your session tomorrow because um, he's done a tremendous amount of work over the last couple of years. And you should go look at the UNICC's project and development. They've won awards for it. And I watch your work closely. So congratulations on everything and the progress that you've made in your team. So definitely encourage you to go to his session and also talk with him in the hall about his team and what they've been doing. So I think we've used our time. And um, yeah, so thank you, everyone, for joining us today. And we'll be around for the next two days. So come find us.